Hello and welcome to Fort Collins Startup Week. Um, thank you for coming to my presentation, um, Retail Merchandising, Big Business, Best Practices uh, with Tammy Parker. So first a little about me. Um, this is a picture of me that was taken at last year's uh, Startup Week. I always really enjoy this whole week and I schedule no appointments with clients so I can really just bop from event to event. Uh, learn as much as I can, meet great people. Um, I really just enjoy this whole week. A um, little about my background. I have 26 years uh, big business experience with giant corporations. I won't mention them today, but at one point I managed nine states um, of merchandisers representing over a hundred, um, we were manufacturers reps. So we represented the manufacturers within their customers' walls went in, did trainings, um, made sure that the sets looked like they were supposed to look, um, kept them fresh, made sure they had new signage, um, all kinds of merchandising stuff. And I learned a great deal from that company. And then I left that company and went to a fashion retailer and learned a whole different side of merchandising. Um, and we'll discuss those differences as we go on. But let's just say I have a huge amount of information and time into this, and I really enjoy this work. First, we're going to go over our agenda for the day. Um, the first thing we're going to discuss is big business best practices and the reasons behind them. Then we're going to talk about planning and being intentional in our merchandising strategy. Next, we're going to talk about being consistent, but not too consistent. Um, there is no merchandising that stays stagnant. Change is always going to happen in your merchandising plan. And then we're going to talk about analyzing the numbers and taking action after that. So first, we're going to learn from big business. And what do we know from them? First of all, you should know they spend a ton of money studying merchandising, and they really know what they're doing. So I'll give you an example. Uh, your King Supers card is really all about you. They're tracking what you buy, how often, and what you buy with it, and how often you buy what you buy with it. Um, they're tracking the order things come out of your cart. They could probably pretty much tell you your path that you took around the store. Um, and that's very important to them. And they use all of this information um, to increase sales, but also for your convenience. Um, I started getting those coupons in the mail from them. Of course, it's full of coupons for things that I buy all the time. And then two or three extra coupons for things that I don't buy that they're wondering if I would like, or they're wondering if I buy it somewhere else and to see if they can have me buy everything from them. Um, so I, I find all that interesting. Some people do feel that it's intrusive. I don't because I, I study it and think that it's just smart business. And it's that kind of smart business that I'm here to teach you today. So let's start with the grocery store. Um, you'll notice in every grocery store that produce is at the front near the main doors of entrance and that milk is in the opposite corner almost always, milk and bread. And here's why. Um, they want you to walk the entire store. They want you to walk past every aisle in case you forgot something, in case you go, oh yeah, I need shampoo. So perishables, the things that you go to the store most for because they expire, are on one end of the store and the opposite end of the store. They want you to take a journey. Now flowers, seasonal and impulse items are going to often be at the front as well. You're gonna see a seasonal section always that's like highlighted at the front. Again, that's impulse purchases, things that you're like, oh yeah, cupcakes would be nice or I have that meeting tomorrow, I should grab some cupcakes to take, that kind of thing. Um, Non-grocery items like shampoo, like um, medications from the pharmacy, cleaning supplies, those are going to be there as well and they want you to walk past them as a little reminder that you might need some dish soap. Um, but they're going to be a little more expensive at the grocery store than they say are at Walmart or Target because that's why you go to Walmart or Target. Um, but the grocery store, you're there for food and they're going to charge you a little more for the convenience of the shampoo. So that's why it's always a little more expensive. They're really maximizing um, on your need for convenience, which of course we all need. Next, we're gonna talk about fashion retail. Um, you should know that anytime you walk into a retail fashion store, clothing store, 
the most expensive things are going to be at the front. And that's my advice for you. You want to show your customer what's special and new first and see if they're interested in that. And that's something else that the fashion retail really does is they know their customer. They really dig into the psyche of their customer, what they're looking for, why they're looking for it. And their displays are made specifically for that customer. They also always have something new. Now, new is really um, subjective. So if they don't have anything to put in the front, they will take something old from the back and put it back out like it's new because you maybe didn't come by a month ago. So they're very careful about what they do, but there's always newness and specialness. Another thing that they do really well is they keep everything neat and tidy and full. To me, this is about respect for the product and expecting your customer to spend more money on it. So think about your own shopping experiences. The stores that have a lower retail price on their items are not quite as tidy or full. They're not gonna worry if they don't have your size because by the way, there might be a giant retailer and you can order it or they can order it for you and it'll come to your door. Um, and they're saving man hours with that. Um, they're saving man hours with not keeping the store tidy as well. But retailers that have higher prices have a neater store. And to me, this speaks to respect. This says, I'm gonna take really good care of my product and set it up beautifully for you because it's worth it. It's worth the $60 for the shirt. We're gonna respect it. We're gonna treat it like it's nice and special because I expect you to pay a nice and special price for it. So keep that in mind with how you leave your store. Um, of course, a lot of evening um, just before closed down activities should be spent on tidying the store, refreshing the sets. Um, that should be one of your closer's responsibility is making sure the store is ready in the morning no matter what kind of store you have. But the better you treat your product, the more your customer will expect to spend on it, okay? Um, so they show us how valuable their product is by how they maintain it. And they also appeal to all the senses, sight, smell, and feel. Yes, they create feelings. I'm sure you probably have a store that you walk into and you know how it's gonna smell. And you know how you're gonna feel in there right? Especially at the holidays. That's especially the time to lean into the other senses. If you need a holiday candles burning or an oil diffuser, um, you, you're going to want to do that. Now, don't let it be too strong. Some customers don't love that, but 85, 90% are going to receive that feeling from those senses that you want them to have. So next, we're going to compare two home improvement stores. I do not have permission to say their names, so I'm not going to. Um, but let's say Blue Home Improvement Store versus Orange Home Improvement Store. Um, I worked around the Blue Home Improvement Store for a very long time, and I learned their merchandising principles from them. They're very, very smart. And did you know that this particular retail chain has doubled in size every year since it began? And the reason they have is that they know and acknowledge that women spend more money than men, even at the home improvement store. So this home improvement store really is focused on its female customers. Now that can seem contrary. I'm sure orange home improvement store would go, nah, our customers are men. But they plan their customer journey all around inspiring future visits. And I'll give you an example. When you're walking down the main front aisle, you are going to pass the display of lights and fans, and they're going to be beautiful. And the newest, most expensive ones are going to be at the front. And you may not be shopping for lights today, but you are going to go, oh, look at that. That looks nice. And maybe you start thinking about the ceiling fan that's on the patio. And we haven't replaced that in a while. It's getting kind of dingy. And when it's time, you're going to go back to that light area to shop for your ceiling fan. They also um, keep everything very clean. Um, and let's face it, women like a clean shopping environment. In this picture, you're gonna, you can see the floors of um, this particular store. You, when you're in that store, you might see a machine driving around with no people. It's completely automated and it's cleaning the floor. 
Um, if you happen to go through the Orange Home Improvement Store, you're going to see a very dirty, dingy floor. Um, and that just makes you feel like everything is dirty there, right? You don't really notice it unless you're looking. Um, also, one of these home improvement stores makes a change every quarter to all of their aesthetic goods. And by that, I mean new paint colors, new paint finishes, new uh, lights, new rugs, new carpet displays, new appliances. Now, not every appliance is going to change over every quarter, but they're going to make sure it's fresh with the newest thing every three months. So that every time you go look, you know you're looking at the newest dishwashers first, right? They're also going to be the most expensive dishwashers because they have the latest tech. Um, they're going to be the, the top line stuff. Again, the best product is at the front. You're going to see it first. So when you think next time you're in these uh, home improvement stores, I recommend that you take some time to see and feel the differences. And they're really just playing to very different customers, right? Um, one is more about property management, construction, building, um, really the bare bones. The other one has all that stuff, but it has more expensive lights. It has more expensive paint. It has more variety. It has way more carpets, different styles of moldings. It really is playing to the woman of that household every time. Want to check my notes real quick. Make sure that I'm not missing anything. Nope, we're good. So all of our um, big business examples have one thing in common. It doesn't matter if you're a clothing retailer or a home improvement retailer, if you're selling diamonds or if you're selling screws. They all have one thing in common and that is that they maximize impulse purchases. So we're gonna be talking a lot about impulse. Um, I'll give you some examples. Our first example is in that same home improvement store. This is Miracle Wipes. Um, it is something that everybody who's doing home improvement stuff might need. So when you're thinking about impulse purchases to purchase for your business, think of two categories. One, everything, something that everybody would need at any time visiting your store. Some really new good examples are hand sanitizer, and masks, right? Um, having themed masks that like really fit in with your business is gonna be a quick impulse purchase. Um, they're kind of becoming an accessory. I have one for Christmas. I have one for football season now. <laughs> and so, yeah, the masks are like an accessory now. And then the hand sanitizer would be good just because you could theme it with scents that fit in with your, your environment. But you can also, it's just something that you run out of that you might, oh yeah, I'm almost out in the car. Because I have a hand sanitizer in my car. I have one in my purse. I have one in my husband's car and I have them in my home. Um, and I hardly leave my home, but those are the things I think I need. So when you're thinking about impulse purchase purchases to buy an order for your store, think about things that every one of your customers might need. The next category is seasonal things. Um, this is at another large retailer. And as you can see, it's Christmas paper and tape, right? You're gonna buy these seasonal things that they might need in bulk. You're gonna get a ton of it. It's gonna be cheap. And every one of your customers that might like buy it might need some. I mean, how many people need wrapping paper in December? Almost everybody. So, um, you also, one of the rules about all of this impulse stuff is to get it all out at once. Um, if I had twice this much wrapping paper, I would have stacked it twice high. You have it all up so that it just goes out the door and you'll be surprised how fast it goes. And then the next thing is again, stuff that everybody might need anytime. Um, we have all seen those aisles of impulse work as you go to the cash register. Near the cash register is your biggest chance to snag your customer's attention with an impulse purchase because they have to stand still there. Um, it also gives them something to look at. You'll notice that these displays are fairly low. That's because children um, are a big part of impulse purchase purchasing. You want the goodies in the kiddos' eyes um, and they can ask for it and, and wait while you're standing and waiting in line. 
Now, if you're a small business retailer, I don't necessarily recommend that you have an aisle that your customer has to go down to get to your cashier. You may not have the room for that, but it is something you wanna consider for the holidays. If you have lines at all around the holidays, the biggest retail season of the year, you're going to want to consider, could you make a pathway where your customer stands in line? One, because it just feels more organized than people all over your store, right? Where's the line? Where do I go? Two, so you can capture them for more impulse sales. Um, and here's a quick statistic for you. 35% of all retail purchases are impulse purchases. So if you are doing no impulse work right now, and I walked into your store and said, we're gonna increase your sales by 35%, you would think I was crazy. But 35% of all retail dollars are driven by impulse purchase. So keep that in mind. Next, we're gonna talk about having a plan and being intentional with your merchandising actions. So this section we're gonna call plan, map, and execute. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is walk your store and think about your customer's journey as they walk in the door. Where do they go first? Where do they, what do they see first? Again, your most high priced, most special, newest items should be there. Um, where will they walk next and what will they see adjacent to that? And just really take a walk around your store. Maybe do some observations and watch customers. If you have multiple entrances, you're going to want to think about both journeys, right? Some customers will always come in one door and some customers will always come in another. Um, I'll share an example of that shortly. I do have some pictures from local businesses that do a beautiful job uh, that I recommend you go check out their merchandising. Um, so as you're walking this space, you're gonna think about what do you want in that space? Consider your inventory levels as well. The product you already own um, and do you have any old product in the back that you wish that you could liquefy? And can it fit in with anything that's going to be in that main traffic area? Um, and also be thinking about things that you might want to order for the next season. Um, I do pl recommend planning your merchandising by season. You're going to plan it at least four times a year, if not more. Um, I do know one of my past careers made plans that changed once a week. So, um, you know, you really do need to be flexible. That's a lot to ask of a small retailer. You may not have enough um, capital for man hours, that sort of thing, or enough product, but at least four times a year, you're gonna wanna re-merchandise your store. Again, as you're walking the store, think about what you want your customer to see, feel, and think. Now, as you walk your store the second time, you're gonna think about impulse items, increasing those sales by 35%. And you're going to start at the register and you're going to walk that journey backwards. You want your registers to be full, to have lots of impulse items around them, but not too cluttered. Pick something and lean into it. When I was a retail manager, one of the things I used to do was I would just ask my cashier what their favorite impulse item was in the store right now. And they would say this item. And I would say, fine, go get six of those items and bring them up here. And I want to see if you can sell all six of them in two hours. You're just going to show every customer, hey, did you know we have this new lip balm? I love this lip balm. I, I use it every day. Um, it has beeswax, whatever. Um, did you need some today? And see if you can sell out of them in, in two hours. By the way, keep the time period short. If it's not working, switch up the product. It can be a lotion. It can be a candle. It can be uh, wipes or hand sanitizer. It doesn't matter what they pick. It should be something they like because then they'll get into the action more. And it's kind of fun. Also, you'll find out which staff members can really sell and which can't. And then you can use those as coaching moments. So we're going to walk our impulse items, the journey backwards. We're gonna start at the register and walk the store backwards through the customer's journey and think about what we wanna pepper in. What are some impulse items I wanna pepper in? This will help you get product out from the back. It'll help you sell, um, you know, sell down product stuff that you maybe sold last season, but you only have four left. Get those bad boys out on the floor and get rid of them. Liquefy your inventory. So next we're gonna make a map of our plan. You're gonna draw 
your store from a bird's eye view. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be on the computer. It can be on plain white printing paper, no big deal. Put an emphasis on your traffic areas. That's where you're gonna really focus your merchandising first. Um, and then you're gonna draw kind of just a rough sketch of what you want in that area. Start with your front door. What do you want your customer walking in to see? Is that a big rectangular area? Uh, what products are gonna be in there? Is there a color scheme? You know, this is gonna be mostly blue items or spring dominant, whatever the theme kind of is. This is just an overview of the product right now. Um, maybe you have a list of things that you ordered that you wanna pencil in in that area. And next you're gonna draw the product next to the main sets or next to the main traffic area. By the way, when I talk about main traffic area, this is your most productive and valuable real estate for you. This drives the most dollars for you. And so really view that aisle as real estate, right? And right up when they first walk in the door is your most valuable piece of real estate. You want your best product there, your best presentation. So what's beside your most valuable real estate? What is, what is the customer going to see as they're looking here and they turn their head? Um, and again, I'll be showing you some good examples from small businesses around town. And finally, you're gonna plan your register area, your impulse area. Um, plan the registers, what you want right there, small things you can display, um, maybe some high value things you want near your cash register because of theft. You wanna make sure that people are really keeping an eye on that. Um, and then again, walk your main traffic area and add little notes about impulse items you're gonna to add to those sets. So this mapping, by the way, don't let it intimidate you. You're the one who's gonna read it. So it just needs to make sense to you and maybe your managers, whoever you're gonna to ask to help you with this. Here's an overview of a map that I drew for a customer. I was helping a customer with a location move and we were just rough sketching out um, the floor plan for that location move. Um, this didn't need to be super detailed, but as you can see, this is just me and a piece of graph paper. Um, the reason I like graph paper is I can measure it in feet, um, which I did do in this. We knew how many feet we were gonna have indoors, um, how many feet windows we're going to take up. That helps you plan your product. Um, but it, this mapping does not need to be um, something that causes you brain damage. It can really just be very basic. Now from big business, we can also learn how to draw the walls and the individual pieces. So these are some examples um, that I pulled from the net. There are merchandising programs that you can download and make something this beautiful. Again, it doesn't have to be this way. When I do this work, I do a square for a shirt, a long rectangle for pants, and an X inside a box for shoes, for example. It doesn't have to be a picture of the item I just have to know what it looks like and be able to tell people what it looks like. So now you've walked your journey, you have drawn your map as rough or as de detailed as you want, and now it's time to execute the plan. First, you're going to make the moves outside of business hours. Sometimes little impulse moves or little uh, adjustments need to be made in the moment because something got empty. Um, however, generally you wanna do a big reveal, right? Let's say you're switching from Halloween to Christmas. Um, I would plan a set on November 1st at night. Um, after we close the store, I would bring in a team. I would order pizza. Um, my team would consist of friends and family of my regular staff. Um, just put them on the payroll for a uh, temporary basis, um, pay them per, the, per hour for that night, or how maybe people that you pay four times a year to come and do this work with you. They should dress to get dirty. This is going to be dirty. Um, and then you're going to give each section a leader and a few people to help them. At the very beginning of the night, you're going to go take the leaders and you're going to explain their map to them, explain the vision. And then you're gonna also talk with them about what you're taking down. You don't just need a plan for what you're putting up. You need a plan for what you're taking down. Is it going to another part of the store? Is it getting boxed up for back stock? Uh, is it going to a sale area? You need to know where that product is going. So it's only moved once. 
Don't put something in a box and then spend men hours to take it back out of the box and put it somewhere else, right? So they need to know the stuff over here, Tammy, is going over to Karen's section. So you guys just take this stuff, put it in a box and get it over to Karen. She's gonna take care of it from there. That kind of thing. If it's going in back stock, you know, have a plan for how you want it labeled. Have some consistency where you're gonna have it put in the back room, things like that. So you're gonna go over the map, the vision, and the plan for the back stock with your leaders. And then you're gonna give them each a couple helpers and send them off to do the work. Um, all of this is gonna save you time and man hours um, in, the, in the long run, I assure you. So a lot of planning goes into before you execute this plan. And then while your team is working, you're gonna observe everybody. You need one person who really knows the maps, who really knows the plan of all the maps, of the journey, of the impulse, to be watching and making sure it's happening correctly. So as you go by, if you see Tammy putting something up wrong or only putting two of something out instead of five, which can fit there, you're gonna to wanna to correct them and make sure it gets done right the first time. So as I said, I wanna do a shout out to some of our local small businesses who really do a beautiful job uh, merchandising. And I do recommend that you go visit them, go walk around, pay them a compliment. I did get permission to show all of these examples by simply walking in and talking to the owner and saying, I think you do a beautiful job. I wanna share some pictures of your store at Fort Collins Startup Week. And everybody was so gracious. And the first one is close to home in Loveland, Colorado. I happen to live in Loveland, so I wanted to share a Loveland example. Um, close to home is down in the Old Town area. It's a woman's boutique. It does have a, some really cool kid stuff there too, but it's a little great gift, gifting destination. What I love about the biggest picture is that they've created a wall with the clothing. So they have this table right when you walk in the door, lots of cool little stuff. Lots, it has some impulse in it. It has some candles. Who doesn't just need a candle once in a while? If you ever need a gift for somebody, you don't know what to get them, buy a candle, you're good. Um, it says we have clothes. It also says we have jewelry. There's a beautiful necklace put on the clothes display. Um, I would even accessorize these clothes more if I were uh, imp impacting this store. But honestly, I did this on a Monday morning. They could have had this different for the busy weekend. And this is the Monday morning look. This could have sold down a little bit. Um, but this table is neat and clean. There's no dust. You're going to expect to pay um, good money for these products because they're treated well. And that's close to home in Loveland. Next is the cupboard. I love the cupboard um, just because I like the way it feels in there. It feels like I'm going to get really high quality stuff. Um, and sometimes I struggle to find what I'm looking for for my kitchen or for gifts. So I usually do the cupboard, especially at the holidays. Um, I also go shopping for myself, take pictures at the cupboard um, and send them to my husband. So his Christmas shopping is easier too. Um, when you walk right into the cupboard, the big table is what you're going to see first. There's always a nice display there. I especially love their Christmas decorations. Um, and I was, you might want to count how many items are there. I wonder how many SKUs are in this picture. It's, it's a lot. Now this is right by their register and they made a conscious choice. They could have had the registers right there and people standing paying when you walk in the door and they have shifted the payment places around the corner because that's not what they want the first impression to be, right? It might have been convenient. Um, it might have been like our cashiers can really see the front door and greet people. But instead, they moved that cashier piece over to the side so that they could have a beautiful entrance. And it was very smart. Um, you'll see the picture of the rainbow colors there as well. Um, when in doubt, if you have lots of colors, go rainbow. Uh, rainbow always gives a feeling of order. It's a feeling of sunshine and happiness. Um, you'll see um, big business retailers use it a lot. Um, and it's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. After that, brown, black, white. But any middle schooler learns Roy G. Biv, the colors of the spectrum, that's the rainbow. Um, and shout out to the cupboard. They were so nice and were flattered that I wanted to include them. Next, I have the Ace Hardware store on College Avenue. Um, I really wanted to go into an Ace Hardware because one, they always do a nice job of merchandising, but two, I wanted to show you, you don't have to be a woman's boutique to do merchandising really well, that the product doesn't have to be beautiful and soft for it to be impactful. 
So they're getting ready for spring. They've got the grill section out. You'll notice the grass uh, turf stuff underneath it. Of course, you don't think it's real grass, but it makes you feel springy. And they have beautiful displays adjacent to their main displays, um, like this barbecue snacks, not barbecue snacks, barbecue sauce and rubs and marinades and all that right by the grills, of course. On the other side of the grill, you would have found um, stuff for the yard and getting ready for spring, uh, fertilizer, rosebush food, things like that. All of this is connected. All of this is spring and back, back um, yard stuff. And they kind of do a, a great job of just kind of making it adjacent, right? And again, this was right in the front door. Now, I also took a picture of uh, their impulse aisle uh, because that's cleaning supplies, dishwashing soap, things like that. You don't go to Ace Hardware for dishwashing soap, but you may need it. And you may need it often enough that they have that there for you as well. Because when you're thinking about the home, you might go, oh yeah, that's right, I need some OxyClean. Um, they do a great job of facing. Both of these pictures are a beautiful example of just making sure all the product is, is pulled forward. That's one of the main things you're going to want your night closers to do is just go through your store and pull everything forward. If they don't have time to restock or fill the back, that's okay. Just make it forward and beautifully lined up. Ace Hardware does a beautiful job of that. My last example is the Perennial Gardener in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I always really enjoy shopping there. I know I'm their customer, right? I'm a middle-aged lady homeowner in Northern Colorado, but I love this store. One of the things I love is they utilize every bit of real estate they have from the floor to the ceiling. When you walk in, there's product hanging above you. It, it might be birdhouses, it might be Christmas ornaments. They are using their real estate. Now, some people, my husband particularly, feels a little claustrophobic in the perennial gardener. It's like a lot to him. Um, so it may not be your vibe. If that's not your vibe and you don't want your store to feel that full, that's okay. Do it, do it differently. But they really utilize just every bit of, of selling space that they have and they do it in a beautiful way. Um, look at the big picture. I wanted to point out that the, um, those fuzzy slippers there, I'll bet the back stock of those is in the drawer behind it. There's probably other back stock in those drawers. That's what I would use them for. So that as those sell down, it's a quick uh, thing for an employee to just to pull more out. I would maybe put the candles back in the other drawer. They have stuff for kids there. They have stuff for mom there. Everything spring. They have a simple um, kind of color scheme going on. Yellows and creams and whites and blues. And they've really just made this compelling. Um, I took a picture of something on the floor because it always surprises me when I look down and find more stuff. Um, but the perennial gardener just does a beautiful job and it's one of my favorite places to shop. I definitely recommend walking that store. So next we're going to talk about being consistent and staying flexible. So we've walked our store and talk, thought about our customer's journey. We have mapped our store and ordered product where we want it and we're ready to execute. We have executed the plan. Things look great. It's nice and clean. So we'll start with what if the plan works? Great. Then you're going to have to refill that display a lot. You're going to have to make changes because the product is going to go away. Uh, we call that in sell down mode. So you're going to be in sell down and you're going to have less of the things people are wanting. So the next plan should be what will fill in those spaces. And if you don't have a plan in place, that's okay. Still fill those spaces. Something that looks a little wonky or maybe doesn't quite go together is better than empty, frankly. Just get as much product as possible out. Um, now, clean and neat and tidy, but full, okay? Um, it is best to have a backup plan. Really just knowing your inventory and what's in the stock room is, is a part of that. You know, um, that perennial gardener display had creams and yellows and blues and whites in it. Um, if it could fit any of those colors or go with those colors and it was in your back stock, you could bring it out if you needed to fill a space. Okay, but what if the plan didn't work? Fine, we learned something today. We're gonna adjust the plan and spice up those, new, those, those areas with more pops of color, something new and compelling, um, some, something that is unexpected, 
um, you know, move some impulse things around to get it close to those sets. Just play with it. Move things around. Leave it for two days. If it didn't work, fix it again, right? Um, you're going to really lean into underutilized product. Um, if you have your front door not doing well, but this one little section over in the back corner is doing well, put the news, put the doing well stuff in the front and move the other back or add them together. Um, if she's, she, sorry, I always say she because women spend more money than men. If the customer is um, shopping in the back and ignoring your front, then that what they want is in the back. So fill it in the front, right? You're going to really um, be able to maximize your inventory here, clean out some things just as you're making adjustment. Um, and if you don't have anything to move, if you have everything on the floor, you could also station an employee there to talk about the set, to greet your customers, ask them what they're shopping for. If they're shopping for a gift or whatever it is, um, say, oh, well, these are really great. They're brand new. We just got them in. They're, you know, so spring feeling, whatever that might be. Coach your employee or have it be you and really talk to your customer because that, they'll help you figure out what needs to be there as well. So I want to state one really hard truth about merchandising, and that is that making adjustments is always part of the plan. You're not going to set up your front door and walk away and leave it for three months. First of all, there's not going to be product there. It's going to be gone, hopefully within a week, right? Um, that's not part of merchandising setting it and leaving it and walking away. Okay, things have to be full and compelling. Next, we're gonna talk about using your CRM system to analyze your success. Dig into your reports. I love reports. I know not everybody does, but I really love them. Um, I like digging into the numbers and seeing what I see. Um, I wanna look for surprises first, um, see what didn't go the way I thought it should. Um, and then I'm gonna take actions um, based on that. When you're looking at reports, I recommend that you think about your controllables, you know, only the things that we can control, really. The number one metric that I love to look at is the average dollars per sale, or ADS. I have heard this uh, same metric in other terms, like average transaction price, ATP, whatever your CRM calls it, how much money is your average transaction adding up to? That's the thing I focus on because that's what I can watch changes from impulse sales increasing by 35%. Um, that's what I can watch SKUs. You know, I want to dig into my newest product, my front door stuff. How is that particular area doing? Take a couple items and look up their SKUs, see what they're doing, see what's selling and what's not from that area. You'll probably know because you have said it and you, you knew what was there and you'll know like the slippers from the perennial garden our gardener are just selling like crazy, but those candles aren't moving at all. So um, really dig into your numbers and then take actions from there. Do you need to order more slippers? Is there time to get more slippers from the vendor? Um, you know, do you have other slippers in the store you could fill that space with? Maybe they're not the right colors, but slippers are selling at the front door. Let's make those sales. So. You're gonna use those metrics to make actions. They can help you also plan better for your next ordering season. I do recommend at the end of each season that you do a deep dive analysis in your CRM to make plans for what you wanna buy next year. Just make notes while it's still fresh in your head. You know, Maybe that's what you do January 2nd every year. You plan next year's holiday. Um, or you make notes while everything's fresh from holiday so you can think about that in July. <laughs> okay, so to recap, we have used biz best bus businesses, best practices, sorry. We have a plan and we want to be intentional with our product uh, placements and merchandising. We are going to be consistent but flexible. And we are going to analyze the numbers and take action. So um, that's really about it for today. Thank you for your time and attention. Um, if you want to reach out to me to ask questions, I would love that. I really wish we were in person so that I could take your questions. But my email is on this screen. My website is on this screen. Uh, do a quick screen grab. Uh, you can also re-watch this presentation as much as you need. I do have a free 30-minute Zoom call for people from Fort Collins Startup Week. So there's the link there as well. If 
Um, again, a screenshot is the best way to reach me. Um, my email is Tammy, T-A-M-I, at unicycle.consulting. There is no .com or .net. That really is all there is. Um, but I would love to talk to you, send me questions, sign up for a 30-minute call at that link, and um, let's talk about your business.